I think, I think of uh, stories as a type of technology, right? Or an extension of, of being human, right? And since the dawn of time, uh, mankind has used uh, storytelling to make sense of the world, you know, through myth, through folklore, and this type of thing, right? And so uh, these three individuals, I think, have uh, developed a certain amount of uh, a depth aptitude for that type of storytelling, for that type of myth making. And so my first question is, you know, what attracted you to that type of um, endeavor? And, and what types of mythopoetic or what type of mythology are you trying to put out into the world? And why? <laughs> that's easy. Come on, that's easy. I know, like, <laughs> All of warm that. up a little bit? Yeah. Please. Yeah, I'm sorry. Look, we ain't got no time. Come on. <laughs> you had to go first. Well, I'll dive in and say uh, the first way, uh, uh, the first kind of myth making maybe mm -hmm. that I uh, loved was horror movies and horror books. Um, and um, at least for me, um, when I look back on it, I didn't think I understood this at the time, but one of the things that I think horror all taught me or maybe more honestly uh, reflected to me was that you could have, I mean, the setup for almost all horror is there is normal life and then a monster appears to make life terrible mm. and then the job of life is to defeat that monster and try to reassert normal life again right um, and for me I grew up in a very chaotic household uh, so to me that felt like actually a very honest reflection of how life felt for me as a child I was um, drawn to horror more than almost any other of the speculative realms mm -hmm. because I felt like all the other ones to my mind seemed too optimistic <laughs> <laughs> about what life is like right. and horror seemed like exactly what life is like and so uh and so for that reason i i became a horror writer kind of from then i don't know that i was accurate but that's how i thought when i was 10 or eight, <laughs> you know wonderful Oops. yeah um i don't know i think i think for me what attracted me to writing these types of stories were secrets, really. Um, because for me, I started writing late. I started writing when I was 20. And I, what, what made me start writing, the, just this idea of, of secrets. There were a lot of secrets that were revolving, that were always just kind of around me, mm -hmm. especially family secrets, um, especially secrets about women. And these are things that, like I didn't know, I wanted to know what those secrets were, and a lot of a lot of when, when I started writing, um, I I was really concerned with answering and and kind of digging into those secrets, and I found that that storytelling allowed me to one ask those questions and two really it gave me it gave me agency to kind of dig into those secrets to ask those questions and and um, because a lot of times if you asked about these, these secret stories that you would hear like a little bit of something and then people would be quiet. And then if you asked about it a little more, they'd tell you to shut up, mm -hmm. you know? Um, I found that, that being a storyteller allowed you to ask those questions without yeah. people shutting you down. So, so that kind of, the need to satisfy my curiosity was really where I started. Mm -hmm. so, it, so it really does function like this kind of technology or this ap application. And I love that, like the extension of, of your curiosity and. Oh, yes. um, the problem solving aspect. I love yes. that. Yeah. Matt, did you want Yeah, and I, I just I just always like telling stories for their own right. I mean, I've been doing this for as long as I can remember, and I was fortunate enough to have parents who encouraged me and, and wanted me to do it. And um, I'm all over the map in terms of genre because I figured Which if you're going to make stuff work. up, yeah. it, 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 why limit yourself yes. to just literary fiction or just straightforward stuff? And the constant theme for me, like my mother, um, my, my grandfather on my mother's side was a missionary from St. Louis who went mm -hmm. down to Brazil and stayed in South America. So my mother was born in the Brazilian jungle and grew up in Argentina during the Peron administration and didn't get in the U.S. until she was 23. And our house became Ellis Island for all of the Brazilian and Uruguayan and Argentinian relatives coming up. So. I kind of grew up in this multicultural theological debate society where I was surrounded by people who saw things very differently than I did and, and were not going to change and you know, you're not allowed to kill each other, you just gotta have your fights and get along. And so the one sort of common thread through all my writing is I like telling stories about people from different 
points of view or different worldviews being forced to interact with each other in a way that doesn't allow for any easy outs. And I also just like telling stories about people who aren't like me and trying to do psychologically realistic portraits of them. So that's sort of what this has allowed me to do. And then I like on top of that to just be able to talk about, you know, vampires and whatever. <laughs> right. So. Vampires and I love the vampires and whatever. You know, I'm, a, I'm a massive fan of horror as well, and uh, you know for very similar, actually very similar reasons as you, Victor. Um, so I was thinking about this as, as you guys were speaking. So there's obviously been this uh, I don't know, resurgence of, of what people call Afrofuturism, right? Um, we like to call it black speculative culture or you know black speculative cultural production. Well, what are some of the things you think? Um, have kind of caused this this really uh, intense interest in um, fantasy, science fiction, horror that's that, that's basically kind of off the beaten track as far as like the mainstream or dealing with people of color's day-to-day uh, -day lives, but in a speculative fashion. Do you, you have any uh, comments about what do you think uh, is going on with this uh, resurgence or this renaissance of black speculative culture? I just made that one. I, I wouldn't. I, no, I just thought I just thought about it when I, when you were, were talking. I'm sorry. I didn't, you know. You know, take your time. Well, I, I think that um, I think that the that the interest has all the, the interest and the need to hear those stories has always been there. Mm. Always been there. Um, I think that what has shifted is that uh, story creators are realizing that one, it's okay to write those stories, that they can write those stories, and, and that people want to hear them. I think, that, I think that that's the main thing, because like this, the interest in science fiction, the interest in, in, uh, in I'm just going to say, African-rooted um, narratives with speculative elements, that's not new. No, that's not, no, it's not. That's not new at all. It's absolutely um, right. But, but like this, 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 uh, feeling that, yes, we can write those stories. I think that is new. I think, mm. think that, yes, we can write these stories on our own terms. That's, that's still very, very new. I think that there's still, still um, storytellers and creators out there who, who feel like they can't yet. But I think that they're seeing more and more of what's coming out now, and they're, they're feeling braver and braver. Yes. But that, that need and that want to see these stories is, is, has been around since human beings were telling stories. And it also got cheaper to do. I mean, oh, yeah. now, I mean, when I was coming up, you, you had to basically find a publishing house to publish you if you wanted to get a novel out. And now if you, you know, there are other routes to do that. It still helps if you're not a practical person to have somebody do, you know, do the publication for you. But you can get your stuff out on the internet. You can get attention drawn to stuff that never was before. And there are a lot more markets to sell into. And yeah, very belatedly now, mm -hmm. yes, the people with money are realizing, oh, yeah, they this is up. actually a really good investment. You They're weren't lying to up. us when you told us in 1980 that you could make money doing this. <laughs> right. Well, I, I think um, uh, maybe there's also just the reality of the enough gen the, all that technology that allows a lot freer access or ability for people to communicate their desire for these stories. Mm -hmm. And then just generations of people, like, uh, you know, that, that scene in uh, World War Z, mm. when the zombies are at the wall, and they just start piling up and piling up and piling right, up. Right, right, well, right. we're the zombies. <laughs> <laughs> and we breach the wall. Uh, of course we and are. <laughs> now we devour everything. <laughs> uh, and I think that's a good <laughs> We are the zombies. <laughs> Why would we be that? That's right. Yeah, definitely. I, I, I totally agree with that. One of, one of the major things I look at is the, the democratization of the means of production, right? And then, like, the. Um, a lot of times you would feel like, you know, you're kind of like isolated. You are that particular like geek of color that's isolated in a particular way. You don't have to be like that anymore, right? So um, that's totally wonderful. And you have, of course, events like this that are popping up all over the place that are actually bringing together enclaves of people to talk about this work. And, you know, I think that, um, you know, this notion of the gatekeeper is uh, like, which gate, what gate, you yeah. know? Um, so you talked a little bit about scenes, except popped in my head. So, um, you know, as a creator, I always have like small, uh, nuggets of things and stories that I create that I, I love um, or, or I, that I really feel proud of. Can you, can you talk about an instance in one of your, your stories that you feel really uh, resonated with you as a writer, as a creator, that you felt was like that perfect nugget that when someone read it that they would <laughs> resonate with it? I just came with that one too. It just popped in my head Sorry. <laughs> while I was talking with you. I'm not, that's, I, what I like about that question is it's a great trap 
Yes, it is. To make it seem like, oh, so they're just going to sit up there and talk about how they're great? <laughs> like, how they came up with great things and they knew it in the moment? Uh, and that's my answer, is just turning it back on you. Oh, what? <laughs> what was one of my favorite things? Let me do that. No. <laughs> <laughs> You're like anti-moderating. Um, oh, so, so is, is there a piece? Uh, I mean, I'm not like to brag on, what you, on your writing. Oh, no, creating, I'm just kidding. I'm just okay. Kidding. <laughs> But yeah, I, I will say, uh, to add to that, I, found, um, I find actually sometimes there are things that I know for sure. I write it down, that sentence, that scene, yeah. and I'm like, this is it, and it just falls dead. Mm -hmm. Like, that also happens, too. Mm -hmm. I'm speaking the other side of things is I'm absolutely sure this is going to be a heartbreaker. Mm -hmm. And then my editor or my wife or something like that be like, you should just cut it before that scene happens. <laughs> <laughs> And I have learned by now to say, okay, <laughs> you're probably right. You're absolutely right. Yeah. <laughs> Hilarious. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Um, I know it's a lot of Any particular, stories. yeah, I mean. What, what, I what, a, what about some of, the, some of the more recent work, like Binti or something? The, the thing is that for me as the writer of those works, I feel like the whole thing. Of course. Of <laughs> resonates course. Yes. in that way for me, um, every aspect of it. When I think of um, the Binti trilogy, I, there isn't one play, like one scene or thing in it that, um, that sticks out more than the rest. Because mm -hmm. like, I see, um, when I, when I, especially when a novel is finished, I see the novel as a living thing. That's right. It's a thing. It's, it's breathing. It's, it's, and then when it's released out in the wild, it's, you know, it's this, this creature that's out there. Yeah. Um, They're the wild, right? All these, this is the wild. <laughs> <laughs> but, but so, so it's like, it's like pointing to, you know, you take a human being and pointing to the, a human being's lung and saying, oh, this is the most valuable part of that human being. Good point. Um, so, yeah, so, so I can't really... <laughs> And, and you can't, yeah, you can't really take a part of it without, without it being connected to another part of it. So it's a hard, if I were, okay, so I'm going to try to, to answer your question. Okay. Um, in, the, in the Binti trilogy, there are these living ships. Mm. And I love those living ships, <laughs> very much so. Um, they're shrimp-like, and they have like breathing rooms in them, so they can. So when they leave the earth, they're, 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 they are ships that can leave the earth and live outside, live in space. You know, and that's kind of a fantasy of mine. You know, I'd love to be able to 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 travel the cosmos without a ship, without having to to rely on all this other technology just to become something else. Mm -hmm. So there's so those living ships kind of manifest that fantasy um, that I have of being able to move through the universe without the baggage of technology. Not, right. I, and I, I almost said the baggage of our bodies. So no, I, I like having a body. That's okay. <laughs> but, but yeah, the baggage of needing technology to be able to move around in space. So yeah, the living ship. There. That's awesome. Answer See? your question. I knew it. <laughs> I knew it was a thing. What about you, Matt? What do you... What do you... Yeah, I'm, I'm kind of... I, I got that same general answer where for me it's, it's not one thing. I mean, if, mm. I think if there's... If, if for me, it's not so much a thing in the book itself. It's, it's a moment mm -hmm. where... Like when I start a, a, a book, I'm obsessed with the idea of it. I've got a sense in my head of the, the way I want to feel when I read it. I'm writing it mainly for me and, you know, right. obviously hoping that other people will like it too. But, one boy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. but there's, you know, so you start out and I usually have a pretty good idea of like, like the first six chapters or so. And then I know how it's going to end. And then there's this foggy area in the middle with little peaks and scenes poking up out of the mist. And mm -hmm. writing it is basically a process of filling in that foggy area and there comes this moment when sort of the front end meets up with the back end and I know it's not done yet mm -hmm. but I know that it actually works and it feels the way I wanted it to feel when I'm writing it the when I when I was imagining it that's that's to me the thing that right, right, right. so, so, it's, so it's, it's not so much a specific moment as a, or a specific item in the book itself it's that moment of completion when it's like okay this was worth doing, spending three years of my life on right. it. It feels the way I wanted it to feel, and so, yeah. Right, right, right. It, so it's just kind of like, I don't know, this epiphany or this affect that you get. And you know, I can, I can point at little bits of business that make me, that, that I'm like, oh yeah, that's, that's really clever, but it's, it's like, it's really that, that totality of, mm -hmm. I, I, 
I get it. Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. It definitely it's, it's a it's a it's a composition and it has life and I, I love that aspect as well. I was um for a second when you said the mist, I geeked out. I thought about the Stephen King movie. Oh, right yeah. quick. <laughs> Sorry, I couldn't stop myself. It was like oh it's gonna be, anyway. <laughs> Oh my God! Um, so, you, so Nettie, I love, I love your analogy of the um, the story being a a person or an entity. You know, that's kind of how I, I definitely mm -hmm. think about the work that I make. And you know, um, yeah. So, so it is like creating life or giving birth or 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 making this new living thing. So, you all have um, have, have have been fortunate enough, I guess, fortunate, I suppose, to to have your work. Uh, be option to be turned into different types of mediations, right? Mm -hmm. So how does it feel to actually take, um, for someone to take something that you've spent all this time on and that you've cultivated, that you've edited and edited and stayed with and been obsessed with for so long and actually put out into the wild, as you said, and then have someone uh, uh, say, hey, you know what, let's take this entity and let's let's make it maybe even wild, wilder or let's, let's change it, let's adapt it. You know, how do you... Um, what does that feel like, and what are some of the process that you go through when you're dealing with that kind of situation? Which is wonderful. I'm excited about the properties that, that will be created from your stories, you know, and, and, and congratulations on that. But I know that it has to be some type of emotional connection or some type of maybe disruption of some kind that, that, that happens when that, when that transpires. So what do you think? Well, I, um, so me, I have um, two things. One thing that I'm adapting myself and... Mm -hmm. Uh, that's been a process of learning to not uh, care about the book so much. Like mm. the book is the book, right? And the 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 say for TV, the show is the show, and the two things can't be the same. Uh, but on the uh, for the other project, it's somebody else who's going to be doing that work. Mm -hmm. And um, I would say what was fortunate was in the first conversation we had before we went through with things. Uh, I got to talk with them about what they were thinking, mm -hmm. and it was really nothing I would do. Mm. Uh, <laughs> and but they had good reasons why they were doing it, right? Do you know, yeah. And I felt like, okay, you know, maybe as a writer, or maybe as a oldest child, or I don't know what the reason is. Uh, I'm a very controlling person, mm -hmm. uh, but I need to learn to let go of that. And trust that there are other smart, talented people on this earth mm -hmm. who can do something new with what the kernel was. Right. And so I think that degree of like sort of humility about it mm -hmm. helped a lot to let that go. And I'm kind of excited for like I can't wait to see what you do. No, seriously, yeah. I mean, the collaborative process is, is super exciting. Yeah. And scary. And scary. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I've got um, I've got a few things that have been optioned and. Um, and so I have Who Fears Death was optioned by HBO. And then I have the, the short story, um, Hello Moto, that, that has been made into a short film um, called Hello Rain. And there are some other things that mm -hmm. I can't announce yet. Um, <laughs> but um, it's, for me, it's, it's, a, it's been a really interesting experience. And like, I'm not the type of writer who holds on to my stories very tightly. Hmm. You know, um, I just feel, I feel like they are, they are, they are proud and strong in themselves. <laughs> so, so I feel like they'll survive out in the world. Um, that said, there are, there's a difference, at least for me, in my experience, there's a difference between TV mm -hmm. and film. Right. Film for, for a novelist, <laughs> watching your, your, your novel turned into a film mm. or made into a film or adapted into a film is a painful thing. Mm. A very, very painful Ouch. thing. <laughs> um, one that I'm very, just, I'm very, very weary of. Okay. Um, so, so we'll, we'll leave that alone. TV, on the other hand, I think I like more because, um, and, and it's not, like I said, I'm not really, I don't hold on closely to the story. I, I'm very, I'm always very interested in seeing what all these other brilliant creators with different skill sets and ideas and visions have for what I've created. I'm really interested in that. Um, and and I'm, I also remain deeply involved too, because I just feel like some things need to be, um, you, you let things go, but some things need to, you need to have some control over some things, and that's important to me. Right. But with TV, what I love about TV is that a novel will stretch out. Mm 
Mm -hmm. You know, and sometimes the TV show will go beyond the novel, and then you get to see what more of the story there is, and I find that very exciting. And, and, then, and then a lot of times with um, TV series, they can take just small scenes in the novel that you didn't get to explore, and you might get to see like that little part expand into something more. So I, I just, I find the whole thing very exciting. Um, I find all kinds of writing learning experiences. Yes. And, I, and I'm always interested in learning, and that's that, like, um, you, you mentioned humility. Um, there's a humility that writers should come at things with, where you don't know everything. You should be aware that you don't know everything, and when you come at things in that way, you learn a lot more. Right. So I, I'm, I'm, I'm very willing to let people tell me things um, that I don't know, mm -hmm. and I'm willing to hear, hear that. And so, so that can be easily said for um, dealing with my stories being optioned, and, and I don't know everything. Right. And, and I'm, I'm very open to listening, because every time I listen, I learn something new. I learn something new about how to tell stories for this medium, right. which is very visual, which is very different from novel writing. So it's, it's all been a great learning experience, and I think that's the most valuable part for me. Excellent, excellent. Um, and so, yeah. yeah, I've got three things in play, actually. Mm -hmm. um, Bad Monkeys has been optioned for Margot Robbie, and um, Set This House in Order has been optioned as an opera by Nico Muley. Cool. What? I did not know about... Uh, okay. <laughs> um, I mean, but it, the thing is with opera, the, the lead time is even longer than with film, so I'll be, I may be much older by the time it actually sees the light of day, but I'm, I'm kind of psyched about that. And then, awesome. um, and then the, big, the big one is, is Lovecraft Country is being done by Jordan Peele and Misha Green for HBO. That's right. Um, and <laughs> I told you they don't. Anyway, it, it, that was a weird thing. I mean, the, the the novel started out as an unsuccessful TV pitch back in 2007. I I couldn't get the people I was talking to interested in the idea of doing you know the X Files with a a black family in Chicago in 1954. And so right. I figured out a way to do it as a novel, always thinking in the back of my head that if if this works, maybe it'll be proof of concept that no, really this could be a good story. Mm -hmm. And uh, for once, my timing was just right. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm but sorry. But some people's aren't. What, what is it? <laughs> what is going on, oh, man? <laughs> that was for was my like, flight. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> I have it silenced. Uh, that was awesome. Yeah. <laughs> that was perfect. Yeah, but I just, let, me, let me make sure mine turned off. Hold up. Okay. Uh, All right, continue. I'm sorry. So now, yeah, now, so sorry about that. basically, Jordan Peele liked my book, and. Um, and I'm, you know, I'm, I'm actually really excited to see what they do. And, and I always feel like I've, I've told my version of the story already. So at this point, it's, it's on the shelf. It'll always be there. Mm -hmm. And I'm yeah. curious to see what they're going to do differently. And, um, you know, it's like so far as from what I can see, it's, it's, it's going to be, it's not going to be my Lovecraft Country, but that's kind of cool. It's just, mm -hmm. it's, it's, a, it's another variation. And I think it's, it's what Nady was saying about, TV expanding things outwards, like, yeah. I mean, the book, because in part, I think, because I was sort of thinking about it as a proof of concept, it's structured very much like a season of TV, and you could actually break the chapters as episodes if you wanted to, but mm -hmm. there's still plenty of room, and, um, and Misha was just tweeting last week that they've got the writer's room together, and um, they're already bouncing ideas off the wall, and she's very, very excited, and I'm very, very excited. So yeah, I, I, it's going to be interesting seeing something of mine in translation and, and where it wonderful. goes from there. So yeah. I'm super excited about it. I'm super I excited am too, about it. So. Um, and I was like, oh, I love that idea. <laughs> um, speaking, of, uh, speaking of Lovecraft, Obviously, <laughs> <There's>, sorry. <laughs> I was trying to figure out. I know. Here's well, the thing. I mean, I you know, way. I think like a lot of us, uh, we grew up reading weird fiction and you know, science fiction, fantasy, horror, and and H.P. Lovecraft is is unavoidable, right? I mean, it, like uh, I think. Well, I mean, yeah, he is. <laughs> I think he's unavoidable. I mean, because he's in a, I mean, and this is something that Victor and I was talking about last night that he is a lot of the. The mythology that he's created, and you know, um, or he created, or, or along with his compadres, who he actually had a sh had shared universes and things like that, um, to carry on some of the, the mythos that he uh, helped put to, put into play. Um, it's hard to deny that a lot of the things that he put into play are like part of the DNA of some of our popular media, right? I mean, um, but also it's hard to deny that he was a prototypically xenophobic and racist and probably extremely classist, right? And this comes through in some of his constructions of the grotesque other or the abject as well, right? So you all three of you have some uh, connections with uh, his mythology. I was, I was curious to see 
what brought you to talking about um, his work and, and, and how you use it. Um, I know that Nettie's uh, space is a little bit more resistant, but I would love to hear. <laughs> <laughs> oh, the shade, I love it. <laughs> um, yeah, so, so, so kind of t tell us about what led you to talk about or to kind of remix or uh, reinterpret some of the things that Lovecraft was dealing with and yeah. Uh, well, in my case, I mean, I, sometimes I think, um, like, if you are introduced to something, like, if you have a un an uncle or an aunt who's not a terribly good person, mm -hmm. but they've been good to you when you were young, <laughs> in some small way, very good way to put it. That's it's great. very difficult to stop loving them entirely, mm -hmm. right? And in fact, the, I think in some ways. Um, the default that people go to is like, well, I loved them when I was younger, so I can't talk bad about them at all, mm. right? Which I think is a different kind of family human dynamic that is also unhealthy, because then you don't get to sort of, uh, you don't get to take apart what was bad about what they did, uh, even as you appreciate what might have been good for you mm. when you were young. And so I really think like, um, uh, like I've had, I have friends and close people who I try to give Lovecraft to now, as adults, and they just bounce off of him, I think, because if you don't access him at a certain time, right. I do wonder if it's just too silly and too troubling for you to just drop all that stuff and get into, right? Right. Uh, but, I mean, but by that standard, I mean, I've got family members who never watched Star Wars when they were young, and then, you know, in this next round, we watched Star Wars together, and they're just sitting there just like, what is this nonsense? <laughs> it's ridiculous. Ah, and it's terribly acted. Totally. What are you doing? There's two right. good actors in this entire first series. <laughs> right. uh, and they're not wrong either, but I sit there and be like, how dare you? Uh, right, you're like, you know, <laughs> this is this sacred. As good as whatever. Like you know? Flash Gordon, right? Yes. Like, yeah, exactly. So, uh, <laughs> at least for me, coming back to Lovecraft um, more recently, uh, for this novella I wrote in, that came out in 2016 called uh, The Ballad of Black Tom, um, it was 2015, and it was the summer. I had just finished up the, uh, a, a draft of a novel and sent it to my editor. Mm -hmm. But like sometimes, you know, after you're done with a, a, a big writing project, it's like uh, your muscles are still actually, they still want to move a little bit. You still have some energy left. That's and right. I was kind of scrambling around for a thing to do and I was picking books off the shelf to read, and I pulled down this book of Lovecraft stories, and I was like, oh, it's been forever since I read that. And then in the same moment as that, that was two, to say it was 2015, so it was the summer when cops were shooting black people, is to say it was every summer, right? Right. Uh, unfortunately. But right. it was that summer, and any number of black folks were being shot mm -hmm. uh, by the cops. Mm -hmm. And I was reading the Lovecraft as, I was, as that news was popping off, and I started thinking to myself, how could I talk about the present by going through this dude in the past? And in particular, his one maybe most racist story called The Horror at Red Hook. Um, Very familiar, yeah. How could I essentially take that story from him and use it yes. in the way I want? And by using it, by writing this story in the past, I could talk about the present in a way that would surprise a reader. Mm -hmm. And for me, that was the, so I had loved him and then I hated him. And then I came to a place of like, it's complicated. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Yes, it is. Yeah. I flew through that novella too. <laughs> Thank you for that. Yeah. Um, I think the first time I came across uh, Matt's work was in an interview between you and Victor, I believe. Um, mm. So what, uh, yeah, that was weird timing. Our books dropped on exactly the same day. And yeah, yeah. Really the same day. Heard rumblings about the Ballad of Black Time as Lovecraft Country was coming up. And yeah. I kind of backed into the Lovecraft theme with that because, again, my point of entry originally was the X-Files. And, mm -hmm. and the question you have to answer if you're going to have a, a show about people having recurring paranormal adventures is what's special about these folks that they're encountering monsters every week? Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. My, my answer for this was that it was a, it's a black family owned a travel agency in Chicago in 1954, and the agency publishes a fictional version of the Green Book called yes. The Safe Negro Travel Guide. Right. And my Fox Mulder character is the son of the family, Atticus Turner, who's a field researcher for the guide, whose job is to drive around the country looking for hotels and restaurants that will take him in. Mm -hmm. 
And he's also a nerd, so he's the kind of guy, if he sees the Loch Ness Monster running across the highway in the middle of the night, he's curious rather than just freaked out. And yeah. he's got the genre savvy to know how to deal with that. So it's going to be, on the one hand, this family dealing with weekly weird tales starring black protagonists in traditionally white roles. And, and, and then at the same time, obviously, it's a black family living in the Jim Crow era, in the era of legal segregation, dealing with the more mundane horrors of that. So they needed something to connect the two kinds of horror. And Lovecraft was kind of perfect for that, because you've got the cosmic horror that he's famous for, but That's he's right. also a white supremacist. So. Lovecraft Country became kind of, yeah, it was a reference both to the paranormal realm where monsters come from, but also white America. Mm -hmm. And that, that's how I got into that. And then I came up with a backstory about a, a group of very Lovecraftian white sorcerers who have designs on Atticus's family. And so that's how that got in there. And Lovecraft is just a subset of the genre stories that I wanted to be able to play with that right. way and, and redo. So, yeah. Excellent, excellent. <laughs> so what do you think? What do you think? Oh, <laughs> God, not, um, okay. Okay, so I'm you trying to get it. my thoughts together. Uh, what are my connections to Lovecraft? That's your question. A little bit. I mean, this. when I when I when I when I knew I was going to be talking to the three of you, I was like, oh, that is an interesting yeah, thing to talk about. <laughs> I don't have any connections to Lovecraft. I no, mean, you do. like, <laughs> um, <laughs> I mean, I don't think that every, like, for example, I see an octopus. I don't think Cthulhu. Mm -hmm. You know, I think, I think octopus. You know, I think, I think it's octopus. It's well, cute. It's, cute. it's intelligent. Yes, right. they are cute. Um, <laughs> It's intelligent. They have yeah. cities. They can. They have control of their bodies. They. They would. They would rule the earth if it weren't for their short lifespans. That's what I think of when I see an octopus. Mm -hmm. um, I love monsters. I do love monsters. Um, I love large, destructive beasts. Kaiju. Yes, kaiju. I love <laughs> kaiju. Um, and I grew up reading a lot of horror. Mm -hmm. You know, if if I had any connection to Lovecraft, which I can't even stand saying that. Sorry. Because I'm not. I'm not a fan, I'm sorry. <laughs> I think we're clear on that. Yeah. And that's an understatement of me not being a fan. But, um, well, well, I did use the word connection loosely. I was talking yeah. about just the, but I'm hoping that you will talk about it because I think it was a resistance space. So, yeah. Okay, I'm sorry. Um, I'll, I'll shut up. But, but I, I, grew, I grew up reading a lot of horror. Mm -hmm. I will say that, you know? And so, so, if any of Lovecraft's DNA, which is a horrible thought, but if any of Lovecraft's <laughs> DNA were, literary DNA were in my work, it would yeah. be through the horror that I grew up reading. Because, like, in my teens, for some reason, I was obsessed with horror. Mm -hmm. Like, I, I read it like just, I was just consuming it like candy. I love candy. Mm. <laughs> and, and so I was, I was reading um, Clive Barker. Yes. I was reading Robert McCammon. I was reading a lot of Stephen King, just mm. consuming all of that. And, and all of those authors are highly influenced by yeah. Lovecraft. So, so if, I, if I had any connection, it would be, um, it would be in that, through that, through that route. But mm -hmm. I don't know. I just. How broadly about, your, about the World Fantasy Award, too. Oh, that. Yes. Yeah, that's uh, kinda... yeah, the World Fantasy Award. Um, do I have to tell that no, story? You know, maybe not. You know, uh, you know I feel comfortable. We yeah, I, I, yeah. I'm, okay. a moderate, I, I'm a moderate moderator. I will, I, will, <laughs> I, will, I will summarize it quickly, really, really quickly. Um, so my, my novel, Who Fears Death, um, won the World Fantasy Award in, what was it, 2010 mm -hmm. um, for, for best novel. And I was the first uh, black person. I'm not sure if it was a person of color. I think it was a person of color who to win that for, um, for best novel. And Who right. Fears Death, post-apocalyptic, set in a part of Africa in the future, featuring an, a sorcerer, you know, all, these things were, that, that was a big deal for, for that novel to win that award. So um, when I, I wasn't at the award ceremony, they mailed, the, they mailed the, the trophy to me and it turned out to be a bust of H.P. Lovecraft's head. <laughs> Okay, yeah. so <laughs> so yes, I guess I need to tell this. <laughs> and um, so I knew of Lovecraft. I was not a fan. Um, I wasn't at that time. You know, I, I knew Lovecraft's work mainly through um, 
re just coming across some of his short stories at when I was a gr undergrad. Um, but I didn't, and I knew of his issues. I knew of them, but I didn't right. know just how deep they were. And so um, I had this, I, I had this trophy, and I, and I was proud of it. I'm like, oh yeah, this is my trophy, but it's Lovecraft's head. But look, it's my trophy, and and okay, and. And I, I was showing it off to my ex-husband. <laughs> like, look at my trophy. And he's a poet. And he looked at it and he's like, wait a minute. Is that H.P. Lovecraft? <laughs> and I'm like, yes. And he's like, let me show you something. And so he took me to the internet and showed me Lovecraft's poem, which was called The Creation of the Nigger. And, and so like, when I saw that poem, his issues, the depth of his issues really kind of became clear to me. And the, the pro, the, the, this trophy being the award that I was given for this novel became very clear. And it was one of those moments where, you know when you don't want to be that black person? <laughs> <laughs> you just don't want to be the one, to, you, but I knew I had to be the one. I knew, I knew. Um, it was important to at least bring this forward because you know it's, it's one thing for this author to be celebrated, and that's fine. <laughs> but I think an author should be celebrated in his or her or zer entirety, completely. Mm -hmm. And I felt like this aspect of him was not being um, brought to the forefront. And 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 maybe and I and I felt that maybe they should rethink the shape of this trophy. Mm. I, di I didn't demand it, but what I did was I went back and I wrote this essay about my feelings about this award and receiving this award. It basically portrayed my experience more than making any demands. I did not say that you should change this award. That essay went on to kind of start a conversation in the science fiction and fantasy world. It was also, not, it wasn't the first time I received death threats, but it was, you know, <laughs> it was one of those times where I received them because it got very heated. Um, it got very heated, it got very racial, it got very, um, it got very problematic. But this went on for years, and then eventually some other writers jumped into it as well, jumped into the conversation as well, and now, um, I think it was just last year they finally changed the shape of the award because right. of this conversation. So that's, yeah, that's my connection to yeah. Lovecraft. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. All right. And, and all of those stories, are, that's an extremely important story, particularly in this space when we're talking about, you know, um, dealing with this idea of symbolic annihilation, where you erase someone's story or to remix people's stories. I think it's extremely important. And again, I'm, I'm, I'm very honored to be on a stage with, with three brave souls who make their own mythology and who are, I think in some ways, you know, uh, turning out these wild tales to, uh, to excite us and to, to have us, uh, to empower us to go out there and fight the good fight. So I really thank you uh, for this opportunity. I'm extremely honored. Um, so I am going to open up I, I, two questions. That's all we got time for. Is that cool? Two. Do, two. Uh, yes, please. Yeah, yeah. No, I'm. You're first. Yeah. That's a really complex question. Yeah. <laughs> so maybe one question. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> That's difficult. Well, I, I'm a big believer in the routine, uh, whatever that routine might be. But uh, so just to quickly say, uh, my wife and I have two kids. Before we had the kids, I could spend six hours writing and produce maybe a paragraph of work. And I would say it was because I'm, I'm so precise and I'm so careful. And it's also because I would listen to some music. And I say, you know, I need some inspiration. I'm going to watch a half hour of a movie. And I'm a this, this, and this, you know, like that. And, so, yeah, and uh, eat a sandwich, that's right. And, uh, you know, the bed should be made, uh, whatever. Uh, and so then uh, our first child was born, our son. And uh, my wife is a writer as well, which means we are both teachers. Um, and uh, <laughs> and uh, so uh, he was born at the end of May. Uh, so we had a little bit of summer uh, off. And uh, she said, like, look, what 
I think we need to do, each of us get two hours out of the house away from this wonderful but draining human, yes? Um, and so my normal routine would have been to go, I'll go downtown, all this, this, and this, but now I only have two hours, and I know that two hours is going to be enforced, yes? So I found a Dunkin' Donuts around the corner from where we live, right? And there was a bathroom in the bus station next door, so I was set, yeah? Uh, and I sat down for that two hours and I worked, and it was very difficult uh, to get myself going, what am I gonna write about, blah, blah, blah. But I found after about three months of that, in that two hours, I would, without fail, produce much more than I ever used to produce in six, yeah? And it was because I was absolutely concentrated in that time, put my phone down, nothing else. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, and as a result now, my writing routine is just, I write from 10 to 12, five days a week in when we're, we have breaks, three days a week when I'm teaching, when school is on. Um, and that's all I do. As soon as it, from 10, as soon as it hits noon, I stop, I'm done for the day. I might do some reading, I might do this and that, but I've done my writing. Uh, and the only thing I wanna throw out there though is I've, I've, I feel like I've talked about that in the past and sometimes people, uh, my wife and I sometimes when we have a fight, after the fight has sort of dissipated, we'll sit down at the dinner table and we'll say, now to each of us, what did you hear me say versus what we, I think I said, mm -hmm. right? So. I like to say, I am not telling anyone, you have to write for two hours a day, you have to do this and this, you have to produce 500 words, but I'm not in any way suggesting some concrete rule. I'm only saying that I think many human beings thrive on a certain routine, especially if you're gonna produce work. And so the whole point of my, my little thing that I just said is just, I found a routine that works for me your life will probably, you, if you can find a routine that works for you and stick with it, you will produce in the manner you need to produce and over time, you will accumulate pages. Uh, and so for me, just as a writer, just the last thing I would say is like, for the, in that two hours, say on average, I produced three pages in that day, maybe, right? At the end of a week, that's 15 pages. In a month, that's 60 pages. At the end of a year, that's 720 pages. 500 of it is garbage. It doesn't matter. You have to write through that garbage. But for me, producing those pages in that routine way is the way that I keep myself from waiting three years to produce 720 pages, right. and 500 of it is still garbage. That's the thing that never goes away. So, uh, so the routine helps me to clear out the colon of my right, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it went too far, I went too far, I'm sorry. What the? I'm sorry. Oh, that was great. <laughs> Um, I, my writing routine, and, and that was really good. You, you've made my, my job a lot easier. <laughs> a lot of things I don't have to say now. Um, uh, my writing routine has changed over time. When I first started, I was very organized. I also, yeah, I didn't have my, my daughter, and I could write the whole day, you know, I, and I was writing every day. Um, but that was because I wanted to. It wasn't because I felt I had to. I, I, I also don't believe in that, that adage, even though Stephen King says we should. Um, I, I don't think you have to write every day. I think you do what works for you, and that's very specific to you as an individual. Also, um, know that just because you do something as a routine and, and as a habit doesn't mean it's the right, the right habit for you. Right. So you have to know when to switch it up. So, so that said, um, yeah, when I started off, I would always, I'd have to write, in a, I had to be in a white room, just had to have white walls, um, mm. where there's a window, yes, uh, <laughs> and I, I had to write a certain number of hours. Like, I, was, I would sit and I would literally write for many, many hours at a time. Um, that was before I had a lot of responsibilities. Now, uh, my writing routine, I can, I can describe it in two words, organized chaos. It's, it's, it's like... I can't exactly tell you how I do it, but I know I do it. You know, I wrote the, the Binti, the first Binti novella that I wrote, I wrote it in airports. I wrote it on the airplane. I wrote it while on the move, you know, and I've that learned, like, because I have a very busy schedule where I could be in like three different countries within the month and I still have deadlines and I still, and not even the deadlines, the deadlines aren't even the problem. It's, it's more, it's what's in my head. Like mm -hmm. if I have to write something, I have to write it. So even if there is just 
complete madness around me, I will write that story. And that's, but, but that's something that I've learned to do and that I've kind of become, I've become that over the years. Like the way I started off is very different than the way I am now. I've written a lot of novels. So, so a lot of, um, a lot of what I, I guess would be routine would be just, it's like something that I don't think about anymore. It's something that just, it's just a part of me. Awesome. So, so when I say that I just do it, it's that routine that I don't even have a name for, that I can't quite put my foot on, that has developed over the years. Because I've maintained, I, when I started my PhD, for example, I, I started with several other students. We were all writers. By the time, that, by the time we all finished, I was the only one left standing. Mm. You know? and, and it's because when I first started that PhD, because that PhD really oh, it tries to beat the, creative, the creativity out of you. But, um, but I came in there. As, I came in there with like um, with a kind of set way of doing things. Like I knew I had to write, and it was just something that I always would do. So even when I had, when I was reading four books at the same time and taking my exams and 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 writing all these papers, I still wrote. Mm -hmm. Like no matter what, I always still wrote. And, and the same with when my daughter was born, I still. Um, always found time to write. So sometimes I would have an hour a day. Sometimes I would have the whole day. Sometimes I would have, I'd have to write at night. Sometimes I have to write it in the day. That's what I mean by chaos. It's right. like, you just get it done. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, they, 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 they both pretty much covered what I would say in terms of, <laughs> I'm sorry. no, discipline is really important for me too, because if I, if I don't do it every day, it's just so easy to, to you know, I, if I'm going to take a break from writing, I'll take a break from writing. But if mm -hmm. I want to get stuff done, I really do need to make myself work every day. And I, I guess the only thing I would add is that, that wanting the finished product badly enough really helps. If you're, you know, and that want can come from I need to pay the bills, I need to meet this deadline so I don't embarrass myself in front of my publishing house, or it can just be right. <laughs> if I don't write this book now, it's never going to happen. And when I think back to my own experience at Cornell, there were plenty of other people in the English department who were you know, interested in writing. And I think the main reason, they, they may have been as talented as I was, but mm -hmm. the difference was that this was always what I wanted to do and what I wanted mm -hmm. to be. And, and you know, I, I, I took the least labor-intensive way to, to get it done when I, when I had a choice. But I was always, there was always something back in the back of my head when I started to get too lazy saying, no, you've really got to get moving on this if this is what you want to do with your life. And I think just some of the other folks just didn't have that. Mm -hmm. And that was the difference. So if you can find a way to want it badly enough and, and to push yourself to, to go for it, you know, and, and that's why you should always, don't let somebody else tell you what story you should be writing. Mm -hmm. Write the story you most want to tell that nobody else is going to do if you do it. And that's probably the best way, a positive way to make yourself sit down and, and get it done. Excellent. Excellent. You know what? I'm, I lied. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. We don't have time for another question. I'm so sorry. I'm sorry, brother. Uh, it's just that I didn't expect that DD would be. Yeah, so here's the thing, though. Here's the thing. Uh, our authors are about to go and do a signing in the, the, um, in the adjacent room, in the Latino Hispanic room, and you can hold your questions till then. I'm, so now I'm not a moderate moderator. I got to cut it off because we have another panel. So my apologies for lying to you. It was Didi's fault. I'm just kidding. No, it's not. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Y'all wonderful. Thank you.